Welcome to Jesus or Muhammad. We have a full house tonight. We're going to address the topic, why are Muslims leaving Islam? This is an important topic because lots of Muslims just seem totally convinced that no one ever leaves Islam. And it's really, really silly to think that way because from the earliest Muslim sources we find people leaving Islam left and right. Abu Bakr, uh, Muhammad's closest companion and the first rightly guided caliph had to fight wars against entire groups of people who were leaving Islam for various reasons and the situation is still uh, with us today. Um, so here on the show tonight we have a couple of apostates. Uh, we have our friend C.L. Edwards with us here again, C.L. was a Muslim for about 10 years, a Salafi, uh, looked like a total terrorist in the pictures <laughs> I saw, uh, and C.L. will be sharing uh, with us tonight as we move along. We also have on Skype our good friend Farhan Qureshi. When Farhan was a Muslim, I, I forget how many debates we had, I would say probably, I don't know, five or six. We had a lot of different debates on a variety of topics, so uh, you can't, you, there's no way you can say Farhan is making this up. But although I have seen some suggested, I have seen a couple of people suggest that this was our plan all along, that Farhan spent years debating Christians, uh, even though he's never really a Muslim, uh, in order to apostatize later on and to make uh, Islam look bad. I've seen people say that, and that shows you how, kind of how desperate uh, some people are to ignore the fact that people do actually leave Islam. It, it's actually quite common. And uh, our, uh, our friend Sam can even testify. We hear from former Muslims all the time, don't we? Don't we hear from yes, Muslims, we do. former Muslims uh, regularly? Yes, we do, actually, that have left Islam by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And when we I do. say we, we hear from them, I don't mean, you know, they've been former Muslims for years and we just, you know, we, we eventually hear from them or something like that. I mean, we regularly, regularly here, uh, people saying, hey, I just left Islam. Hey, I live in India, or I live in Pakistan, or I live in the Middle East, and I want you to know, you guys, uh, from watching videos or sometimes watching this show, um, or reading articles or something like that, I realize Islam can't be true, and, uh, and I left. So we hear from former Muslims all the time. Most of them don't go, uh, most of them don't go public, and you know, that's, that's a pretty wise decision, given, to, given what could happen to them uh, in certain places. Uh, but the, our Muslim friends here tonight certainly are going public, and we're going to look at uh, some of the reasons why people leave Islam. And, and just to be clear, people can leave any position. People can leave Christianity. People can leave atheism. I left atheism. Uh, people can leave all kinds of positions, and people can do so for good reasons or for bad reasons. So people can leave Islam for bad reasons. If, if someone came to me and said, hey, I just left Islam, and I say, well, why'd you do that? And he said, uh, you know, well, I, I really wanted to eat pork. You know, I, I mean, you know, I always wanted to try ham all my life, and you know, and I wanted to try it, and I realized I have to leave Islam in order to eat pork, so, uh, so I left Islam. I, I, I wouldn't think that's a that's a very good reason. I would think that's an extreme. You know, so even though the person left Islam, I would think, wow, that is a really really dumb reason uh, to leave a religion. Uh, so the, you, people can leave Islam for bad reasons. Question is. Um, are some people leaving Islam for good reasons? And we're going uh, we're, we're to focus, because we've already had a show where we focus exclusively on CL, we're going to focus on getting the background from, uh, from our friend Farhan, but we're going to have uh, CL add comments throughout, and let's see how things go. If you want to call in tonight, probably not going to take calls for the first hour or so, since we have four people on the program tonight. Um, so if you want to call, call in after the first hour, and we'll try to get to as many calls as we can. So, uh, Farhan, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Peace and love to you guys. God bless you. Hey, how, how's it going? And every, everyone I know of, everyone I know of uh, who knew Farhan back when he was a Muslim and, and debated with him or had dialogues with him, everyone would say Farhan was, was our, favorite, our favorite Muslim. I said that, I think, in several, in several uh, uh, public debates, just because you, you are, unlike, unlike certain other Muslims, you are really easy to get along with, and you seem to actually be thinking about the material rather than uh, you know, just, just dogmatically asserting things and never changing your views. Um, and I think part of the reason for that was even in becoming a Muslim, you had to, you had to modify what you were raised to believe. Is that right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I had to modify what I had, what I believed, 
or what I was taught by my parents for the first 17 years. They were taught a, a different version of Islam. And then I came to uh, Orthodox Sunni Islam and spent 10 years uh, practicing it, uh, being a mu'azin in the masjid, which means I called the adhan to the, to the prayer regularly. I recited the Qur'an. I went to the masjid regularly, praying five times a day. I spent money uh, uh, traveling, uh, time, effort. I, I dedicated a good portion of my life uh, to this religion for, for, for a good 10 to 15 years. And uh, it was a grieving process to leave it, absolutely a grieving process to leave it. But now, you know, I think that I've reached the acceptance phase and, and I feel liberated more than ever. Uh, Farhan, uh, while you are while you are a Muslim, most Muslims don't actually actually go out and engage in public debates. Why did you want to go out and defend Islam in that way? Because you, you debated Sam Shamoon, you debated me several times, you debated Nabil Qureshi, you debated James White. So you you debate you took on uh, you took on most of the the people who are going around uh, defending Christianity in public debate. What what? Why did you do that? As a, you, because most most people don't do that. So so what? Why did you end up doing that? Well, I mean, Islam was a it was the source of, of of my identity. It was the source of my 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 spirituality and my global brotherhood. Uh, I mean, it meant everything to me. You know what I mean? I, like I said, I did, dedicated so much time and effort praying and whatnot. And to see that 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 the source of uh, of my identity was being challenged the way that it was, uh, I felt that it was crucial for me to not only know why why I believe what I believe, but be able to defend it. Um, and so I was willing to do that very passionately, and and I had the opportunity to to do that w w with you guys. And not only that, but it helped me to challenge my own beliefs. And you guys helped me to challenge my own beliefs. Uh, you guys exposed me to some information I was not aware of, uh, that that got me to think harder. And and and, um, and the process just went along the way that it did. Did uh, did did anything from from those actual debates? Because you you. you... And I, I noticed this a long time ago. Uh, you, you seem to be a little bit different in the debates, and that you're uh, you're regarding the actual debates as a kind of as a kind of learning process in preparing for the debates and engaging the debates. Lots of people are already convinced when they're walking into a debate. They're already completely convinced. Uh, the other person's arguments are, you know, just the other person's ammunition in, in this battle. Whereas, you know, you seem to, you, you know, to regard this as as, as an opportunity. Uh, for learning, uh, what did you? How much did you learn from from the actual debates? What what kind of things were there that that uh, that kind of messed with your mind a little bit? Well, I mean, you know, going back to the Ahmadi Dr. Zakir Naik era, you know, when 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 there was not a lot of information out about Islam, you know, you had these these websites, but in terms of you know, something that you could listen to, uh, you know, material that you could read. There wasn't a lot of material out there. Now, don't get me wrong. I was absolutely convinced that Islam was the ultimate reality behind our existence. I passionately believed it, and I was willing to defend it. But I, I think my open-mindedness had a lot to do, you know, j just being an American, being exposed to diversity and plurality from the get-go, you know, having a Western education, um, and falling in love with it, falling in love with, with America and, and the diversity and plurality here. And so it helped me to, to, to be a little bit more open-minded, uh, I think, rather than, you know, being protected extremely, you know, by, by rigid parents who, if you don't believe and practice our religion, um, you know, th th that you're going to be, you know, th that we're going to hurt you and abandon you and that kind of thing. So being born and raised in America helped a lot, but don't get me wrong, I was passionately a Muslim and I was convinced. But, but the debate format was an opportunity for me to look at I information and know why I believe what I believe um, and, and defend it as well. I mean, I was, I was definitely practicing what, what's known in psychology as confirmation bias, which means that even if David or, or Sam or any of these guys or William Lane Craig in his epic debates with Shabir Ali, which I was being, first, which I was being exposed to the, for the first time since the D. Zakir Naik era, uh, you know, that, that he still had a response, you know what I mean? Even if the response made no sense whatsoever, the response was there. And I, and I was willing to use what we call in psychology confirmation bias and just, you know, look for the information that confirmed my, my, my belief as a Muslim. 
And so I was doing that, but not knowing that I was doing that at that point. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much uh, uh, how, how I used apologetics, uh, both to defend uh, what I passionately believed and, and, and to defend the Ummah, which I had spent, you know, countless hours studying and going to the masjid and listening to these scholars and participating, uh, you know, in these various halaqa that they had at the masajid, traveling to Chicago to go to Isna year after year, you know, th this kind of thing. You know, I was defending that and learning simultaneously, and I think that that's a good thing. Sam, yeah, you, Sam, wanna, yeah, Sam, you said Sam, something. Sam had a question for you. Yeah, you said something that's quite interesting. <clears throat> you said that <clears throat> because Shibra Ali provided a response, <clears throat> you used that to justify believing in what you believe, irrespective of wh whether this response was valid or not. And you call that confirmation bias. Can you expound on that? Because I find that's common among Muslims. No matter how sure. bad, <clears throat> no matter how irrational, illogical res response may be, the simple fact that there is a response somehow justifies yeah. in their mind to continue to believe what they believe. Could you expound on that? Why is that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, first, let, let me give some examples because David asked about you know what the debates did for me particularly. Like for example, when David Wood would bring certain uh, issues up, whether it was uh, you know Muhammad's marriage to Zainab, whether it was the satanic verses, whether it was the incident of Abdullah ibn, uh, Abdullah ibn Abi Sar, and there was numerous examples like these that I was bombarded with that you know I had not thought about completely before. I had a basic foundation that Tawheed is true, uh, the, the spirituality in Islam is true, it's beautiful, it's aesthetic, it uplifts me, and that's why I, I need to defend this religion. And so what happened was when, when David would give, me those, would give me those arguments, I would purposely go to scholars and ask them and purposely look into the books and the materials and in the debates to find a response because, because I want Islam to be, to be true emotionally, uh, in terms of, of, of protecting my ego from, um, from anxiety, which is called the defense mechanism in, in, in psychoanalytics. And so it was a defense mechanism. It was a, it was a confirmation bias that, that many human beings fall, fall to. And, and I was doing it, and so many other Muslims are doing it when it comes to these issues like Abdullah ibn Abi Sa'id, simply because th th there is a response. For example, I, I brought up, I've, since I've left Islam, I've brought up that incident of Abdullah ibn Abi Sar a few times. And, you know, I get Muslims who send me emails saying, look, the, here's the response from Islamic awareness or whatever. Yeah. As if, you know, simply because there's a response, you know, there, there's a reason why, how we can interpret this yes, to get away, as, to as, get around as if, it. as if you didn't look at this before. Right, exactly. And a matter of fact, I looked at it, the, the same material that they were giving me was what I, what I looked at in order to prepare for my debate for you. Um, and, and then going back and listening to my debate with you, uh, you know, helped me, helped me think about the issue a little bit more, too, of how my, my personal response was not, was not the best, uh, was not a good legitimate response. Um, I, I have a question I'd like to ask you and CL because uh, you were a public debater when you were a Muslim. CL, uh, are your are your YouTube videos still up when you're a Muslim? Are yes. they still up? Yes. They're still yes. up. Yes. They're still yes. up. Um, what what I wanted to ask is because you talked about wanting to defend Islam against objection. Was it more? Uh, was your goal in debating more to defend Islam against criticisms, or was it more? offensive in that it, your, your goal is to actually convince other people of your view and, and, and what, we, what Christians would call evangelism. Are you, do, are you doing a kind of dawah, trying to show people that Islam is true, or did you just want people not to get bad information about Islam that was being spread by you know, people like me or Sam Shamoon? Can you hear us? You there? Can you hear us? Oh, you you're asking me, or you I thought you were asking me. No, that's yeah. you, I was, yeah. I, was, I, was ask, I was asking both of you, but you <laughs> okay, can go first. Head. Oh, no, no, okay, so, so in response to that, it, it, was, it was both. I was doing, uh, you have to understand, before I got involved in with, with, with you guys, with you and Nabil and Sam Shamoon and you guys, I was, I was debating and inviting uh, Ahmadis or Qadianis to Islam regularly. Mm -hmm. I was doing da'wah, and I was actually, you know, frustrating the Ahmadis back then for, for the first uh, six years of my Muslim life or my Sunni Muslim life. And I was debating them, going to their masjid, debating my own family, inviting them to Sunni Islam. And so, so, so uh, when I found out that Nabil Qureshi had left uh, Ahmed, uh, Ahmadiyya Islam 
for Christianity that invoked uh, a desire in me to start learning more and more about Christianity. I mean, as an Ahmadi, I had already, you know, because as Ahmadis and Nabil can confirm this, you know, uh, that we had to learn how to do tabligh to Christians too. So we had books like, you know, A Journey from Facts to Fiction, uh, Christianity and Islam by Mirza Tahir Ahmed. And we would read those books about Christianity, but they were very poor. They're like Ahmadi Dad, Zakir Naik type, type arguments. And th those were the type of arguments that I was exposed to and used to at that point. And so I was doing uh, da'wah to Ahmadis, and, the, and then when I found out that Nabil had was baptized, this was an opportunity for me to, to delve more into Christianity and, and, and start to invite uh, Christians to, to, again, my source of brotherhood and spirituality and identity and that kind of thing. And right. so it was both. It was both an opportunity to learn and it was an opportunity to do da'wah. Yeah, I, I don't know if you remember, but I was, I was, uh, I was there. We were actually uh, in Virginia Beach on that little fake mountain um, when, when, when you found out uh, Nabil, when you found out Nabil was, uh, uh, had become a Christian, right. you and Asin Malik. And what, what I thought was interesting was you and, you and Asin were both former uh, Ahmadis, and you both right. seemed excited. You both seemed really excited that Nabil had, uh, had left that, even though he had become a Christian. You both, like, were thrilled. And so it seemed that you guys really, really disliked that, uh, your, your former right. position. Uh, CL, you also were um, putting out the. You were putting out YouTube videos. You were That's putting right. out YouTube videos, um, defending your beliefs. What, what was the what was what was the goal there? Did you want to Did you want to correct uh, the arguments of, of Christians, or uh, were you trying to convince people that your view is the correct one? No, I was trying to do dawa. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get people to renounce Christianity and become Muslim or whatever they believed in. That's my whole goal. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I didn't. Want, I really wasn't interested in going back and forth with anybody. I just wanted to show, look how ridiculous Christianity is. You should be Muslim. You know, <laughs> you, you know, it'd be interesting if one day you uh, you had a little debate with yourself, right? You 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 put up you play you play some clips. You play some clips of some old argument you had, and then yeah. you sit there. Now here's why this guy is wrong, even though it's you. Yeah, and and like a lot of Muslims, like I've yet to meet a Muslim who could ever explain certain Christian doctrines accurately. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it either. Like I did a video on uh, you know, about the incarnation, but it was all, it just, it's, if you go look at it, it's just totally messed up mm -hmm. because I, my whole thing was like, <laughs> based on something I read from someone, uh, that my understanding was Jesus had incarnated and gave up his divinity for a time, yeah. and then he was a man, mm -hmm. and then at, the, at, at his resurrection, he took his divinity back. And so, you know, to me, of course, that, that sounds crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, me saying it, that doesn't sound right. And that's mm -hmm. not even what Christians really exactly. believe. That's yeah. not the orthodox exactly. position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So most Muslims don't know what the ortho orthodox position on these doctrines are. Mm -hmm. So you get these skewed ideas or you'll read some type of definition of it, like maybe a couple of sentences, and then you read your own understanding into it or misunderstanding mm -hmm. in, into <clears> it. And th then you, you try to use that against Christians. Look, did you know about this? Did you know Jesus gave up his divinity and became a human being and mm -hmm. took it back after he died? And yeah. unfortunately, yeah, that's funny, man. That's funny. a lot of Christians, they don't know doctrine either. Mm -hmm. yeah. The average pew goer, you know, they don't know anything about this. So you start telling them they can't give you an answer back. They can't say anything. Mm -hmm. They look foolish themselves. Yeah. So it's like, well, you, how can you believe this? Mm -hmm. You should take it. I have a book here. Then you, that's when you start coming with the, the, the claims for the Quran. And we have the Quran. It's never been changed. It was from the time of Muhammad. It's from the time here. It's exactly the same and all this other mm -hmm. stuff that we know that's not true. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, it's delusion on top of delusion. Mm -hmm. All right, we have, to, we have to take a quick yeah, break. And when we come yeah, back, when we, when we come back, question, yeah. I, want, I, want, I also want Sam to address an important issue. Just because this is so absolutely important, what, what, what CL just said, about Muslims not even having an accurate view of yeah, the, the claims be, they're yeah. trying to refute. And is this inherent question. to Islam? Does this that's have exactly something to do to with asked. the nature of Islam? Or is this just happen to be some, some poorly informed uh, Muslims? We're going to address that when we come back in just a moment. And we'll, uh, we'll hear more from Farhan in just a moment here on Jesus or Muhammad.
If you'd like to support ABN's ministry, you can give us a call at 248-416-1300 or you can visit our website at www.abnsat.com. ABN appreciates your support and donations. Muhammad, we are asking a question why Muslims are leaving Islam and you know there, a Muslim can have all kinds of reasons for leaving Islam. We're going to focus on two uh, former Muslims tonight to get their reasons. Uh, but first, Sam, yeah. uh, uh, <clears throat> our friend Ciel brought up uh, an important point, yeah. namely that he as a Muslim wasn't even uh, describing Christian doctrine accurately when yeah. he was criticizing it, and I mean this is this is this is not unique to CL. This is every Muslim mm. apologist, every Muslim debater, uh, every Muslim who is criticizing Christianity. Always, 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 you'll find that they are not even accurately representing Christian doctrine that they're refuting. Now, now, you know, people can people can criticize a doctrine while accurately describing the doctrine. For instance, uh, everyone, uh, everyone here, everyone who's t speaking right now, um, criticizes Islam. But when we do so, we don't try to misrepresent it and then attack our misrepresentation. That's called a straw man in philosophy. You're not attacking a real man, you're building a fake man that kind of looks like him and then attacking that. And similarly, we find that when Muslims are attacking the doctrine of the Trinity or the doctrine of the Incarnation, they're not attacking our real view. They're not even attacking the correct view. They're attacking some uh, strange uh, version of the doctrine that has no basis in actual uh, Christian thought. So, Sam, well, yeah. why is that so common in Islam? Because, I mean, people like James White pointed out in every debate, every when are you time, accurately yeah. going to, when are you going to accurately describe my belief that you're Precisely. attacking? Precisely. Um, <clears throat> that's interesting that you asked me to answer that question, because I actually was going to comment on it, mm -hmm. and I hope, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and His mercy, my voice keeps up. Mm -hmm. So keep us in prayer. We have more shows to do tomorrow, and pray that by the grace and mercy of the Lord, our voice keeps up and doesn't give out. But <clears throat> uh, the reason why you find such misrepresentation of essential Christian doctrine, it's because it's part and parcel. It's inherent in Islam because the Quran itself, the authority for Muslims, misrepresents Christian doctrine. So it's not just Muslims that are doing it. They're very religious source. And the, the reason why that's a major problem for Muslims <clears throat> is because the Quran is supposedly the revelation of an omniscient being. You know, they claim that it comes from the all-knowing God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, if, if it came from God, then surely the Quran would accurately represent the doctrines of Christians. But that's exactly what we do not find in the scriptures of the Quran, or the pages of the Quran, I should say. Let me just give you, for the t sake of time, an example of that. And again, I hope my voice keeps up by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus. 
Chapter 5, verse 72 and 73. <clears throat> now, some people may think I'm splitting hairs. However, I've actually documented this in some of my articles, and I have another article underway, Lord willing, where I'm going to actually provide more quotations from Christians before, during, and after the time of Muhammad who are going to say the following, that it is improper to say that God is Jesus because it's more proper to say that Jesus is God. Now, someone will say, well, I just said a mouthful, and it seems like I'm splitting hairs. Actually, I'm not. Because when Christians say Jesus is God, they mean that he's fully God in essence, but he's not the only person of the Godhead, nor does he exhaust the Godhead. <clears throat> However, to say that God is Jesus would imply that he is the only person in the Godhead and that he does exhaust the Godhead. Now, this is not an argument that I just came up with. This is an argument that Christians have been making even before the time of Muhammad. For example, Neil Anderson, who was a convert to Islam, <clears throat> in his book quotes an historian creed which says Jesus is God but God is not Jesus Christ is God but God is not Christ and this was stated right around the time of Muhammad's birth and people after the time of Muhammad in their debates against Muslims would actually point this out when your Quran makes this assertion it's wrong because that's not what we say and what am I talking about let's look at chapter 5 or 72 <clears throat> They are unbelievers who say Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. We have actually writings from Muslim polemicists trying to respond to the Christians who say that's a mistake. And this will come out, uh, Lord willing, it's forthcoming in one of my articles where I quote the Muslim saying, the Christians are saying the Quran is wrong in saying this, but then he goes about to try to prove, well, even though you may not say it in those exact words, you still imply it nonetheless. So this is not a modern Christian criticism of the Quran. You can find arguments <clears throat> raised by Christians historically during the medieval period against the formulation of the Quran in describing what we believe concerning the deity of Christ. Now, the problem with this statement is obvious if you just continue reading the passage, chapter 5 or 72. Because in the Quran, to say that Allah is the Christ basically means that we Christians believe that Jesus is identical with the God who sent him. Where am I getting this from, Dave? Thank you for asking me. Let's continue reading the passage. It says, for the Messiah said, children of Israel, serve Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Did you catch it here? Allah is identified as the one that Jesus calls his Lord, which in Christian theology would be God the Father. Mm -hmm. So in the Quran, Christians are being accused of believing that Jesus is identical with the God who sent him. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? No. Do you believe that? No. In Christian theology, the God who sent Jesus is the Father, and Trinitarianism affirms that Jesus is not the Father. So right here, the Quran itself shows that this formulation is mistaken because that's not what we say. And again, because time is fleeting, let's skip to verse 73 and see how it again misrepresents not just the deity of Christ, but what we believe as Trinitarians. Chapter 5, verse 73 literally reads, and by the way, <clears throat> I have to warn our audience, especially the non-Muslims, who are reading Abdullah Yusuf Ali, Abdullah Yusuf Ali butchers the Arabic. In his translation, it reads pretty much, they are blasphemers who say, Allah is one of three in a trinity. That's his translation. Allah is one of three in the trinity. Now, if that's what the Quran said, then it would be accurate in that Allah here, again, would be equated with the God that sent Jesus, would be, would be the Father. And we do believe that God the Father is one of three in a trinity. But that's not what the Arabic Quran says. The literal translation is, there are unbelievers who say, Allah is the third of three. The third of three. <clears throat> now let me quickly break down why this is a problematic assertion. Number one, if by Allah you mean the God who sent Jesus, in Christian theology, that's the Father. In Christian theology, the Father is not the third of three, He's the first of three. That's number one. If, however, by Allah you mean the Godhead, well, the Godhead is the Trinity, and no Trinitarian says the Trinity is the third of three. Mm -hmm. Either way, this is a mistaken formulation. Interestingly, the very same context and the same, very same chapter tells us what third of three means. You don't need to guess. Muhammad, or the authors of the Quran, mistakenly assume that we believe that Allah, Mary, and Jesus are three gods. So when it says that Allah is the third of three, in the context of the surah itself, that means the third of three gods consisting of Allah, Mary, and Jesus. 
Now he asked me, what's the proof? The proof is chapter 5, verse 75, chapter 5, verse 116. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to read 116. Now watch this. Now do the math for me, okay, guys? <clears throat> As my voice keeps up by the grace of God, do the math and count. When Allah, and this is chapter 5, verse 116 again, when Allah said, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto men, take me and my mother as two gods besides Allah? Now do the math. Jesus and Mary, two gods besides Allah. How many is that? That would be three. It's not four? No. So now it makes sense why early in the chapter, Christians are accused of saying Allah is the third of three because later on we're told that Christians supposedly believe Allah, Mary, and Jesus are three gods. Mm. Now let me ask CL and David. Historically, has the historic Orthodox Church, when I say Orthodox Church, I'm not talking about the Orthodox uh, de denomination. I'm talking about what has been believed by true Christians historically throughout the centuries. Can we find any statement from any Christian theologian or any creed that says that the Trinity is three gods consisting of God, Mary, and their offspring, Jesus? Uh, you're talk, You're asking about orthodox. I can't even think of any unorthodox. I can't think of anyone who who makes that claim. And and it's so bad. Muslims actually have to hype. They have to say there was this hypothetical group that Muhammad was responding to that we have no record of, and we've you know they 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 just we they their existence was wiped out, and we don't even know that they existed. We have no record of them. And the reason that's so silly is, I mean, if this is the Quran, this is the book that's going to be spread throughout the world. Obviously, he's going to respond to the main doctrine, right? right? Exactly. He's going to refute exactly. Christians like us, right? Just to add, add to what you said, let's assume for argument's sake they're correct. This, these statements are just to he heterodox groups. All right. Let's say these verses are just to them. Then why doesn't the Quran ever address, define accurately, and condemn what Orthodox Christians believe? If the Quran is so concerned with the, with the doctrine of the Trinity as something contrary to who God is, then why don't we find any single verse of the Quran accurately defining what the Trinity is and saying it's false? You don't find it. So even for argument's sake, let's say, okay, it's not attacking Orthodox Christians, but heterodox, heterodox groups. Why is Allah so busy dealing with an insignificant group, right, that's out there in the margins, <clears throat> but never addresses what the majority of Christians believe at that time and even before Muhammad? Maybe, maybe Allah didn't have a problem with, him, with Orthodox <laughs> Christians. Maybe Muhammad was a Christian. <laughs> yeah. And it, and his yeah, teachings yeah, were later yeah. corrupted by Uthman. Precisely. Right? That's why he had to burn all the Quran. Exactly. Uh, very very hey. interesting. Uh, Sam, but but since, since some people not, might not be might not be might not be familiar with with why you you can't say uh, that God is Jesus is saying the same thing as Jesus is God. Yeah. That would be somewhat like saying Sam is human, therefore humanity is Sam. Precisely. Right. Yeah, humanity, we, we, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, we can't. We, we can say Sam is human. We can't say humanity is Sam because there's there's Unless more to. Unless you think I'm big enough to consist yeah. of six billion people. Yeah, yeah. Is that so, what you're saying? Yeah, that's what we're saying. <laughs> and similarly, saying Jesus is God is not the same as saying uh, God is Jesus because exactly. you'd be saying everything that is God, including Father and Spirit, would be Jesus, mm -hmm. and that would be incorrect. But the point is, even if you think everything Sam just said is total nonsense it, theologically, right? Even if you think. It's just absurd, the doctrine of the Trinity, it's ridiculous, Sam's wrong, he has no clue. All that stuff that Sam said about what Christians believe is just total nonsense. The point is, even if you think Sam uh, believes something that's false and ridiculous, we would at least expect God to know what he's saying, right? Yep, we would expect exactly. God to know what he's saying and that God would attack what Sam actually believes. But what we find in the Quran is Allah doesn't have a clue what we believe. Allah seems to be someone who heard Christians saying something about God and something about Jesus and then came up with some ridiculous thing that we've never believed. And then responds to that. Here's what Christians believe. No, we don't. No, we don't. No Christians believe that. No Christians have ever believed that. Why are you responding to it? Why is this in the Quran? Why can't you respond to our actual view, Allah? That's a problem. Now, we want to get, uh, we want to, uh, because that was so important, that was important, but we want to get back to uh, CL and Farhan. Uh, we haven't heard from Farhan in a little while, so Farhan, uh, I wanted to, to, to get down to, to some specific issues because you, you mentioned that leaving Islam was such, uh, was such a major change, was such a, you know, a, a difficult step to make. Uh, what were, if you had to list some of, the main, you know, some of the main reasons, what would be some, kind of the big issues that pushed you over that edge? 
I mean, I think it, I think that it was a couple of reasons. Uh, the 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 first and foremost reason was uh, due to my education in psychology and my pursuit in for in a career in mental health. I was de I was dealing with a lot of people who 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 are suffering. You know, people who are self mutilating, cutting themselves, suicidal ideation. Uh, you know, all kinds of you know mental and psychological disturbances and so I saw a lot of suffering and I thought about them and I thought about a lot of you know just general humanity uh, and I thought about you know what Islam uh, you know says about them in general that their lives are a waste because they're not you know bowing to Allah five times a day saying stuff in Arabic and growing their beards and their women aren't wearing hijab as if that is the purpose for why God <laughs> created them you know what I mean and on top of that, that their destiny is going to be, as chapter 4, verse 56 says, that their skin is going to be burned off and replaced with new skin yeah. uh, endlessly. An actual physical endless torture that they're, going, that they're going to go through. And I think it was a combination of putting all of that together uh, that opened up all of the other issues that, for example, that I've been reading about and, and even debating about with you, with you guys and other people, you know, stuff like Abdullah ibn Abi Said and, and, and uh, you know, Zainab's marriage to, to, and the satanic verses and, you know, the list could go on and on about the controversial things about Muhammad ibn Abdullah uh, and, and, and his companions. But that was the big thing that, that, that came at me um, was, was understanding the intense indoctrination literally it's one of it's probably the most intense and most disturbing indoctrination that that exists on our planet today and it gets people to 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 act violently and viciously and oppress people and want to implement sharia law this is what that type of what this is what this type of indoctrination does even if you think that that we can reinterpret islam we can you know Islam can 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 be reinterpreted in a peaceful way, where where we can focus on all of the positive verses. There is still a massive element there, and there's 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 plenty of verses in Ahadith to support it that get Muslims to do crazy things. And he, and I, everyone sees it. I mean, even the Muslims sees it. They just turn see it. They're just turning a blind eye to it because they're emotionally attached, like I was, you know, to their identity as a Muslim. And here's, and here's my, my, my message to the Muslims, is that, look, I, I understand that you're emotionally attached and, you, and that you have this love for your religion. But, but, but there is so much else that, about Islam that's detrimental to broader humanity and that, that, that there needs to be a movement uh, of, of people speaking against, against an idea that's very dangerous for society. And I didn't realize that until recently. And, 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 you know, to be liberated from it, from, from it I could only want that for, for, for so many. Even, you know, when I see, you know, when I see Muslims now, you know, as, as an apostate, I see these bearded guys and these women wearing the niqab. You know, before I used to be like, mashallah, you know, they're, 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 they're so much into the deen. I want me and my wife, my Sunni Muslim wife that I want, wanted, you know, I want to be like that. You know what I mean? And now when I see it, it, it breaks my heart. You know, even if they think, even if they convince themselves that this is, you know, that, that, that this is good for them, you know, even if they think that it's good for them, you know what I mean? It still breaks my heart to see them, th th them you know, being lured by, by, this, ideolo by, by this ideology when, when they could be so much more of a human being than that. <clears throat> I, I, wanted, I wanted to ask a question to Farhan and then one for you, but... Farhan, you kept mentioning Abdullah ibn Abisar, and you also mentioned the story of Zainab. Now, there are some people who may be tuning in for the first time, have no clue what you're talking about. In fact, as you are well aware, there are even a lot of Muslims who have no idea about the incident with Abdullah ibn Abisar, as well as Zainab. Can you briefly touch on those two uh, incidents, because those were some of the things that troubled you. What was it about <clears throat> Abdullah ibn Abisar that troubled you? And what was it about Zainab that troubled you? Could you elaborate briefly? And then I'll have a question for you about why, what troubled you enough to leave Islam. Mm -hmm. so. uh, sure. sure. Uh, and I brought up uh, <clears throat> the story of uh, Abdullah ibn Abi Sar before in, in, in other dialogues that I've had. And, and the reason why that one disturbs me the most um, is because he, he was receiving the revelation, you know, Muhammad ibn Abdullah was receiving, uh, you know, revelation from Allah. I think it was Surah Al-Mu'minun. And, and, you know, and, and Abdullah was able to, you know, add, you know, a, as he wanted to, 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 the, to, the, to the book of Allah. And, and that frustrated him 
to the point that he apostated from Islam, and then you know, and then a death sentence was was sent by Muhammad, uh, and and uh, you know, Uthman had to you know per, get, get convince Muhammad not to kill him. In order to convince Muhammad not to kill him, they had to coerce him to convert back to Islam. I mean, that was just it was altogether a disturbing story that you know that that really you know shook me you know when I actually did the research behind it um, and the story so of Zainab quickly, that was something that David would yeah, before you get okay. to Zainab real quickly so just so I can understand what you're saying and this is for the benefit audience you're telling me that this this gentleman named Abdullah ibn Abisar would actually change the messages that Muhammad claimed he was receiving from Allah which led to his apostasy because any sensible person would conclude like he did wait Muhammad, if you're telling me what you're writing down or asking me to write down are revelations from God, there is no way that I can influence you to change those revelations. Is that what happened? Yeah, he was actually adding to the verses. Like, for mm -hmm. example, Muhammad would finish, finish an ayah, and Abdullah ibn Abi Sa'd would say that something that rhymes with it, uh, mm -hmm. and it was profound. And Muhammad was like, yeah, go ahead and write that. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, it seems that his reasoning it seems that his reasoning is is exactly parallel to the Muslim who who might think about the story today in other words if you're Abdullah you're thinking uh, wait a minute if I mean if this guy's a prophet then I'm a prophet too because I'm saying things and and he's writing them down as revelations of the Quran um, but a Muslim today can and he left Islam over that he left Islam he yeah, said look awesome, if right. there's no way this guy's a prophet or I wouldn't be allowed to change his revelations but I am allowed to change the revelations and therefore, this guy can't. This 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 message can't be from God. But a Muslim can look at that exact and may and have that exact same reasoning. Wait a minute! I believe the Quran is this perfect word of God, and yet there was a guy, one of Muhammad's scribes, who could improve it. Yes. Who could improve it? Muhammad says, "Yeah, not write, it, write it that way." Not inspired. Yeah. But what if someone tells, "Hold on, Farhan, well, that, those are fabricated stories. They're not based on authentic uh, Sunni sources." Now, I'm sure you've come with come up. Uh, I've met Muslims who've used that argument. So didn't you entertain that idea as you were studying that story? Didn't you think that maybe this, these are fraudulent tales and therefore they don't hold any weight as far as Sunni Islam is concerned? If so, then how did you deal with that? Well, I mean, I, I, did, think that, I did think that for a while. And a matter of fact, I was finding ways and I was finding the typical arguments, you know, against that, that, that it was fabricated. This is not from an authentic source. Um, you, you know, stuff, j j just a typical Muslim response. You know, I mean, th this is a typical response that Muslims give. You know, what, what you're saying is that, oh, th this, is, this is not fabricated and stuff like that. But there's so many stories like this about Muhammad that they consider fabricated. First of all, why do these fabrications even exist? Exactly. Second of all, I think David Wood made an excellent point uh, w w when he debated Robert Spencer w w in terms of the principle of, embar of, of embarrassment. Why even narrate this in the first place? And then on top of that, you know, there's so many other incidents like the satanic verses, you know, is another perfect example of, uh, of this. Um, and, and it has like over 30, you know, chains of narration leading to it. You know what I mean? And why would people fabricate this, you know what I mean, about their beloved? Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, I mean, it, it, again, it took me, like I said, uh, to, to realize that Islam is not the ultimate reality behind our existence in order for everything else to start making sense. You know what I mean? Before, I had to have a reason and interpretation to get around it. I see. And, oh, and again, real quickly, what about Zainab? What was it about Zainab that showed me? Because you mentioned Zainab, the story of Zainab. What is that all about? Well, David, uh, I think, in two of our debates brought her up. And, you know, I, I, I found myself, you know, desperately trying to say that, Oh, Muhammad was a man, you know, he got aroused when he saw her and, you know, and, and stuff like that. That's natural. That, that, that's, the, that's the type of, you know, arguments um, that, that I had in my mind. You know what I mean? There's a reason why, as a, as a he was still a human being, he was an angel, and so he naturally had these inclinations. But okay, even if he did, you know what I mean? You have to be the better man mm -hmm. than, than to try to get your own uh, adopted son's daughter. You know what I mean? There, there, has, you, there, there, has to be, there, there has to be a bigger morality there. That even if Allah revealed to you that, that you could have her, you should still be the better man and, and say, no, this is my adopted son's daughter, dude. I got to chill out on that. And, and it didn't happen that way. 
and and you know I I, I just think that 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 the story is just not it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense to me it doesn't make se any sense to me yeah you can say that again <laughs> so so basically these are stories that you concluded that couldn't be fabrications because if they're fabricated why would anyone create such stories making Muhammad look so bad so it had to have the ring of truth and if that's the case then how could Muhammad be a prophet now that's what led you to your eventual apostasy and I don't know if we have to come up in a break if we do but I'd like you to tell, share with the audience what were some of the reasons that led you to question Islam which eventually led to your apostasy now your, your story is somewhat different from, from, from uh, for, for Han in that although both of you left Islam, one of you came to the Christian faith. You're now a devout Christian, whereas Farhan, uh, again, Farhan, could you, could you give us an idea of what your beliefs are? Because uh, I don't want to misrepresent you. I don't want to say you're a Hindu or a New Ager. I'd, what, what do you believe yeah, now, where, right now? Where are you at now, Farhan? <clears throat> yes, on your spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. uh, to, in order to state my beliefs, I always say, say, say the same thing. I am an agnostic theist, which means I don't know what the ultimate reality behind our existence is, but I am a theist. I am a believer in God, um, and I'm open to the possibilities, and I open up my imagination to the possibilities. I do not firmly uh, 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 argue for uh, any any particular truth claim that's out there, but I but but I but I try to imagine and be be creative in terms of thinking about what the possibilities are. And so that's pretty much where I am. And I've thought about a lot of different possibilities. I'm constantly praying. I just talked to Dr. Um, uh, Corbin of, of yogadangers.com for full four hours yes, uh, two days ago. I ta I've been talking to Shreve Ministries, Michael Shreve, who's, who's written, uh, you know, who went through Hinduism. Um, uh, it, for, well, it was actually Sikhism, and he was doing Kundalini Yoga. He, he, I talked to him for a couple hours, and we prayed together, and he sent me his book. So I have a, po a lot of positive relationships with Christian miss uh, missionaries that are out there. I, I love the story of Jesus. You know, the, 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 sh the name of the show is Jesus or Muhammad. Um, I still think that there are certain things that Muhammad said and did that, were, that, 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 could, that people can focus on, that certain Muslims do focus on and can get good things from them. But I do think that, 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 that very broadly the, sto the story of Jesus is more inspiring, more spiritual, uh, and it resonates more w with me spiritually than, than than some of the rigidness experienced there in Muhammad's life. Yeah. Uh, so if I were to choose one, I would say Jesus definitely speaks to me more. Um, but That's I right. but That's but right. right now I would say I'm firmly I'm firmly an agnostic theist. Yes. Well, you know, Farhan, we're going to ask all of our audience that are watching this program who are committed Christians to continue to pray for you for your journey because we we are convinced and. I know this may sound like, well, because, you know, we're Christian fanatics, but we are convinced that Jesus is risen, he is alive, and that if you open your heart and seek him, he will reveal himself to you eventually in his time, and we believe that there will be a day in which you'll be worshiping Jesus with us, and we'll rejoice with you on that day. And, and, and what, what's cool about Farhan is, you know, with lots of people out there, you can say, you know, hey, lots of people don't change their views, you know what I mean? Whatever, yeah, you know, he, they're, yeah. they're raised to believe something, and they just always believe that it's true. But with Farhan, you know, he starts off as, a, as, as an Ahmadi, and he's someone who will actually say, you know, I see things that are false in there, and I'm not going to just continue to, to follow it just exactly. because, you know, I was, I was raised to believe that. Um, I'm going to go to something else that seems more true, That's, and then yeah, he goes to quality. Islam, and then he does the same thing with Islam, and so this is not someone who's going to cling to a position once he sees uh, some exactly. problems with it. Yeah. So it seems at some point we're going to have to show you there's a problem with rejecting Jesus. But that's not what we're here tonight. We're here <laughs> no, we just to, want to hear, yeah, 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 tonight, reason, yeah. tonight we want to, we're, we're interested in, in reasons for leaving Islam. Uh, we have to go to a quick break right now. We'll be back in just and a moment and we're going to get CL. Yep. We're going we're to get our friend CL, yes. uh, who's got some different reasons for, uh, for rejecting Islam. And we're going to continue looking into why Muslims are leaving Islam. We'll see you in just a moment on Jesus or Muhammad.
Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. We've been talking uh, with our friend Farhan Qureshi uh, for the last segment. And Farhan's reasons, if, if I were to, to summarize his reasons for abandoning Islam, I'm not sure I'm putting the thought process together exactly, but he named a couple of major reasons, and they, they kinda, it kind of fits together as a reason to reject Islam. Sounds like Farhan is... Uh, bothered by the problem of uh, intense human suffering and the idea that you know these people who are going through suffering that, 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 that he knew are, according to Islam, after they go through all these problems in this life, uh, without much hope of ever getting out of them, in the afterlife, their skin's going to be you know, burned off and then replaced and then burned off and replaced. So they have tons of suffering in this life, and then they're just going to get nothing but the same uh, in the afterlife. And so that is something for Han uh, views as a massive problem, um, and that Islam is having a, a, a negative impact both on, on people and on the world. And, and he has said that there are good aspects of Muhammad. I would, I would agree. There are things that I would look at in Muhammad's life or, or individual things that Muhammad did, and I would say, hey, that, that, was, uh, that was good. But on the, on, the whole, on the whole, Islam has a profoundly negative impact on, on human beings. And so these are problems. Now, here's the thing. Problems can be outweighed, right? You can see a problem with something and have that problem outweighed by other evidence. So, I mean, for instance, there are all kinds of, uh, of, of theories out there, right? There are, there are all kinds of, down through the ages, there have been scientific theories where someone looks at, you know, some scientific, for instance, I'll, I'll tell you, when, when someone said, no, the, the earth goes, or the earth actually goes around the sun. The earth goes around the sun, not the other way around. The sun is not going around the earth. Uh, what was the problem with that? Well, if the Earth is going around the sun, we are moving really, really fast right now. We are spinning at about 1,000 miles an hour, and we are hurtling through space. It doesn't feel like that. That's a problem. That's a problem with the view. But here's the thing. Even when we look and say there's something wrong with that theory, that the evidence can outweigh any problems we might see. And ultimately, the evidence for the Earth going around the sun outweighed any objections like, hey, shouldn't I feel myself moving very rapidly right now? And similarly, Farhan sees these problems. Uh, there could be something to outweigh, but he looked at the evidence, and what did he find? He found problems like Muhammad's relationship with Zainab or uh, with uh, Abdullah ibn Sar. And, and the, so he saw nothing but, pr nothing but further problems with Islam. So instead of looking to Islam and finding something that outweighs all of these uh, things that were bothering him, he found just more problems, and so there's nothing there to, to be his anchor, to, to, to hold him in this religion. And so, Ciel, you have a different background. You weren't raised as a Muslim. You actually chose Islam for yourself at some point. And we, we've talked about this before, but uh, for now, you left Islam. You left Islam after, after being there for 10 years, after doing the prayers, after making videos, trying to convince other people, uh, you, you ever actually lead someone to Islam? Uh, yeah, <laughs> actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so leading someone to Islam, and then something you spent a good portion of your adult life on, right? As you so, know, most of all my twenties and early thirties. All your twenties and your early thirties you spent on Islam, and then you say. It's all wrong. Why? What could possibly convince you to leave that? Well, similar to uh, Farhan, I was very, uh, I was on a spiritual path from a young age. Um, like I said, I was, bo I was raised in a Christian home. We were Baptists, went to church every uh, week, almost every week, you know. But to be honest, and not to put down my family in case they're watching, um, you know, beyond going to church and reading a couple of scriptures that the pastor gave out, the Bible didn't get touched again until the next Sunday. And unfortunately, I told people this as I was giving my testimony a few nights ago at another venue, that for a lot of Christians, Christianity is something you do on Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day. That's Christianity. It's almost ritualistic, and that's not what it's supposed to be because we... To follow Christ, Christ is a person who came and incarnated and came to earth. He's not a set of rituals. You know, he's not a, con he's not a concept. The gospel is not just affirming one, two, three sets of, of data and information about Jesus. You're affirming a real historical person who historically came, was put to death, 
and was really resurrected from the grave. So you didn't have that? No, I didn't have that. Okay. And I, and I had so many questions, and I had so many uh, just wonderings, and I was very inquisitive, so I like to read about everything. I like to read about every religion and every um, ideology, you know, even atheism. At one point, I was an atheist. You just sit around and listen to the infidel guy. And um, finally, I Reggie? Said, Reggie? Are you Reggie? talking about Reggie? Yeah. What's up, yeah. man? <laughs> What's up, Reggie? Uh, yeah, man. I've been on, I, I was on Reggie's show before. Okay, that's cool. All right, yeah, you should ahead. listen to that. Yeah. So um, um, I was in my 20s. Basically, I, I came to the point where I said, okay, there is a God. Something created this universe. Things don't just pop out of nowhere for no apparent reason. This universe came from somewhere. It came from a God, a higher being. Who is he? I, I need to know who he is. I know who I was told he was supposed to be. I know what the Bible says. I know what the, my family says. But I want to know him for my. I need to know what the truth is for myself. So that was the number one question. What's truth? There's all these people saying this, all these religions, all these paths. Everybody claims, everybody swears that their understanding, their ideology is the truth. Everybody else is wrong. So who's telling the truth? It can be very uh, confusing. Um, so I began to study different interpretations of Islam. First, it was the Nation Islam. Actually, I almost came to the point of joining the Nation of Islam until I found out about the mothership. Then I was. Like, <laughs> what do you mean mothership? Just explain to those who don't know what's hey, a mothership. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, I want to. Uh, hold on, I want to point something out for those for those of you who think Sam Shamoon is so smart and he's so brilliant. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You were also you were also drawn to that. As yeah, well, right, uh, just Sam? for the record, so the people don't think that I became an official member of the Nation of Islam because I saw it somewhere on the website where they accused me of that. I was introduced to Islam by a, a member of the Nation of Islam because I had never heard about Muslims, had no idea what, was, what Islam was until this African-American introduced me to uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Master Fard Muhammad, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, Minister Louis Farrakhan, and the mothership. Yeah. Right, the mothership, he even mentioned that. So I'm like, what in the world is this guy talking about? And I said, can you give me whatever book you're reading? When he gave me the Quran, on my own, I studied the Quran, and I thought it was the Word of God. So I was exposed to Islam by a member of the Nation of Islam, but just for the record, I don't want people, because there's a Muslim who actually <clears throat> lied about my testimony, said, oh, he was a former NOI, meaning a member of the Nation of Islam. I never officially joined. However, it was the Nation of Islam that introduced me to his version of Islam. I didn't know any better. And for the record, one of my heroes at that time was Malcolm, Malcolm X. X. Mm -hmm. I would get, at that time, it was VHS. There was no DVD. So did, that, did, you, did you at some point actually believe that was the truth? I believed that the, the, the Quran was true. Uh -huh. So uh, whatever the Quran said, I believe was true. But I couldn't see what this guy was telling me. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, when he told me the mothership, I couldn't find it in the Quran. <laughs> I couldn't, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, but I did believe the Quran was true and that the, the Muhammad of the Quran was true. And the Lord Jesus saved me. From so if we're talking about why people left Islam, we've actually, we've actually, yeah. we could, we could toss yeah. you somewhere in the mix. Yeah, you can. But one, one reason why I don't mention it, I don't want Muslims to accuse me of trying to cook up my testimony mm -hmm. yeah. using it to open doors. I don't need that to open doors. I trust in Jesus Christ to do so. So mm -hmm. that's why. But hey, continue with your mothership, my friend. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I, they had me up to the point where they started talking about the mothership was going to come and kill all the white people. I, mm, <laughs> no I way. Know. Uh, no, By the no, way, do I qualify for Caucasian, or would I be uh, no, would you, I be safe? You have some flavor in you. Yeah, right. You have a little Hold flavor on, in true, you, true so or so false? You get out of, true uh, or false? You <laughs> referred to white people as white devils just earlier today. <laughs> yeah, in a joke? Okay, yeah, okay, okay. Joke? yeah, gee, just get them in trouble, why don't you? Yeah. Like, so I was done with that. Um, there's another group called the Nation of Gods and Earths, the Five Percent. Oh boy, who I was attracted to, um, and from that I kind of got attracted to a lot of uh, occultism. Um, and magic, so um, I got into that for a little while. But you like yeah. the five percent? Yeah. I like but that. ultimately, you decided to become a hundred percenter. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Go yeah. ahead. Continue. Then I actually went back to church, and I got involved in this in a particular ministry, where the pastor said that she was a prophet. Oh wow! Right, and she said she was a prophet, and uh, she gave some predictions to me to some other people. Of course, the predictions didn't come true, but everybody still believes she was a prophet. Well, hang on, like, like, like a prophet, like prophet of a, you know, some further revelation, or just I, I can, you know, I know things that are going to happen. She would literally say, "Thus saith the Lord." Oh, yeah, that's oh, wow. okay. okay, that's some crazy stuff. Utter right? blasphemy, yeah, yeah, that's so, blasphemous. 
I thought, this is what Christianity is. So I've, and, and I was really involved in that ministry. I was like, well, this Christianity stuff, it's just people just, you know, speaking in tongues and dancing around and making up stuff that doesn't come true. I'm done with this, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. So, 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 so in other <laughs> words, much like we, we, we talked about earlier, Muslims are rejecting not actual Christian yeah, doctrine, yeah, but yeah. misrepresentations yeah, of Christian yeah, doctrine. Exactly. You're representing Christianity based on a really weird version of Christianity. Exactly. Okay. So I never, I never understood any of that stuff. But real Orthodox Christianity was I just what I saw. What I saw and how people behaved, I didn't like it. And one of the things I always used to ask people, even my family members, is why don't people, okay, we're Christians, why don't we ever behave like the people in the Bible? Mm -hmm. you, know, why don't we, you know, isn't it, shouldn't the Bible tell you how to live and how to, how to conduct yourself? You know, it shouldn't just be something you do on Sunday. So when I saw Muslims, and the first thing I ever saw of Islam was the Malcolm X movie. Well, actually, it was the book. I read the book before I saw the movie. That really turned me on to Islam. I liked the, the fact when he went to Hajj and, you know, he was standing with uh, Muslims of every race and nationality and they were all going around the Kaaba making a tawaf. And that really attracted me. So I began to read Muslim material online, started seeing D-Dot videos. I, then when I saw the D-Dot videos and all the different material, I was like, oh, the Christians can't answer any of this stuff. They're decimating the Christians, and, you know, finally I was like, okay, I, I really want to be a part of this stuff, but I didn't take my shahada yet. I used to go downtown in downtown Detroit. I used to go to this bookstore uh, with a brother there, there named Abdul Hamid, who I still know to this day. Mm -hmm. He asked me why I don't come to the store anymore. Uh, I, said, I wonder he, why. He said, oh, I'm Christian. He said, you can still come buy some stuff, you know. <laughs> but um, when I came to the mosque, there was a guy, uh, his name was Ahmed. He was from the uh, Jamiat Tablik, Tab Tabliki Jamiat. That's one of the biggest Muslim organizations in the world. I think someone told me there were like 80 million Tablikis in the world today. Um, he gave me my shahada. He invited me to go speak to his sheikh. I went to go speak to his sheikh. We spoke for four hours straight. He offered his um, niece to me in marriage. I was like, man, I like this religion. Wow, that's, quite, that's a good deal. <laughs> yeah. That's how, they tempt, that's how they tried to tempt Muhammad. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about it is when I went to their house, it was like nothing I ever seen in my life. They didn't have a television. They didn't have uh, records and CDs or rap music or rock music, any of that stuff. All they sat around did was read Quran all day long and make Salat, read Quran. And he had two wives. They were covered from head to toe in the cop. I, I liked the whole thing because I was like, man, these people are disciplined. These people are holy. You know, these are holy people, and I want to be like them. So I really got into it. I left uh, the Tablikis, and I got involved. Um, I went to a conference put on by a group called QSS, Quran and Sunnah Society, a, a big Salafi uh, organization in America that got turned on to Salafism. I like that, uh, the whole idea of Quran and Sunnah only. So long story short is I was married. At a, I got married in maybe around 2005. My wife, she never liked or accepted Salafia or Salafi Islam. She didn't like the Salafi masjid. But Who doesn't like Salafis? <laughs> What's wrong? Oh, okay. she, didn't like them, what, one, she didn't like the way that women were being treated. She said women were being mistreated. And I, my whole reaction to her was, you're, you, know, you don't know the Quran or Sunnah. You're ignorant. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, let, 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 let me just pause for one second, Sam. Not, yes. too, not too much detail, but given the, Salaf, the way Salafis yeah. act towards women, Yes. Would that be pretty much in accordance with the way Muhammad and his companions yeah. would deal with women? Or? Yeah, exactly. I would say that the closest version to the Islam practiced by Muhammad and his companions, Islam ordained in the Quran, is Salafi Islam. In other words, if yes. you and I, God forbid, yeah, may the Lord Jesus never allow it to happen, yes. We're to be convinced at some point. You know, we're, we're debating a Muslim and he gives us just such a phenomenal case for Islam that we were to convert. Yeah. You and I, like CL, would ultimately become Salafis because... Yeah, you'd uh, have to if you're yeah. going to be honest to the sources, yes. That doesn't mean they're perfect in everything. Mm -hmm. They're the closest thing to authentic Islam as defined in the Quran and as practiced by Muhammad and his followers as far as the Sunni sources are concerned. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. All right, go ahead, CL. So at this point, 
I finally became a convinced I found the truth that I've been looking for my whole entire life that I've been asking people for. I asked deacons and pastors, and I asked my mother and my father, and I asked everybody. Nobody could give me an answer. Now I finally found it because I found Quran and Sunnah. The Quran has never been changed or altered. The Sunnah, the whole thing, I got the truth. So I spent my whole entire, this half of my life was spent in the masjid and the halakha, sit and listen to the, at the feet of the ulama, and I'm thinking, this is going to bring me joy and happiness. And it kind of it brought me happiness at first. But the troubles of life were common to everyone. And I began to feel, I always dealt with depression in my life. So I always had a problem with depression. Now I began to feel depressed again. And I couldn't understand why I don't have any joy. Or, and I'm feeling depressed. when, I, And I get up at Fajr every day. I make the Sunnahs every day. I, mean, I fast Ramadan. You know, I'm fasting uh, the, the fast of Dawood every other day. I'm doing everything according to the sunnah that I can possibly do. And by the way, just for the audience, because this comes from the hadith, what do you mean the fasting of Dawood? Who is Dawood and what do you mean his fast? Where did you get that Dawood, from? Just David, to clarify for them. King David, Dawood in Arabic. The fast of Dawood uh, was a fast. It's in a hadith for Muhammad. He used to fast every... No, someone came to Muhammad and wanted to fast every single day. And then Muhammad told him that, that to do that, but to do the fast of Dawood, which was every other day. Mm. Okay. So, All right, see. All right. So that's the sunnah. So you have, uh, I try to stretch my whole entire life according to the sunnah to the point where I would go, when I, I insisted when I went to work that I wear a jalabiya and a kufi <laughs> at my job, you know, and I'm around non-Muslims, kafirs. So this is my dawah because I'm, I'm exuding the sunnah to them. At all times and places, I started making the videos on YouTube like I did. But like I said, I was not happy at all. My marriage started crumbling and falling apart because I was a strict uh, Salafi, and she didn't really want to have anything to do with that. Um, then I really had the question, like, if this is the truth, shouldn't I be happy? I mean, I know life can't be perfect, but I mean... I mean, this should be some type of joy and happiness. I'm doing everything Allah wants me to do. And another problem, from the beginning of me taking shahada, I never felt close to Allah. I never felt, you know, the whole concept of God being Abba, Father. I mean, a Father, that's relational. Father to Son, that's relational, the whole thing in Christianity. But in Islam, I never felt close to Allah like I knew Allah, I felt Allah. I just, like, he was just a concept. He was someone above the throne who I had to obey or get struck down so that contributed to the depression as well so last year I went through Ramadan did everything I was supposed to do at the end of Ramadan I felt totally defeated I felt still depressed I felt you know no joy at all uh, I began to go online and really debate Christians really strong but really it was a cover for the lack of faith that I had, that I wanted to debate these Christians. Hold on. So if that were true for you, do you think that some of the Muslims that Sam and I deal with I, on a regular basis? I know it's true. They, keep, they want to <laughs> talk about it over and over and over and over again because they're, still, they're trying to work it out inside their own souls themselves. So that's why the, and the more antagonistic they may seem, you, don't, you never know. That's why you have to answer them. They go home and they think about it. When they're laying on their bed at night, they're thinking about the things you told them. And that's exactly what happened to me. I remember a Christian said to me, I said, you know, God cannot come into his universe. He can't come into creation, you know. And he said, what's wrong with your God that he can't come into his own creation, <laughs> you know. And I was like, that, that, that seems something real simple, but it struck me in my heart like, why can't my God come into his own creation? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm insisting that he can't do it, but why can't he do it? Yeah. Because he said he can't do it. It's like circular, um, a circular logic, you know. And that was a wake-up call. Um, I began to notice a lot of things I believe about Islam and the Quran and Sunnah is circular logic. God can't incarnate as a man, but Allah has a body and he's 60, cu 60 cubits high. And people will see him, but they won't recognize him. And he'll bury his shin, and people will bow down to him. It just, I'm like, this stuff doesn't make sense. You know, I was saying it to myself. I'm not saying this out loud to anybody else. You know, I'm still going to the mass and doing everything I'm supposed to do. And I continue to debate with these Muslims, with the Christians, because I wanted to hear what the Christians had to say. And 
when I went online, I started listening to you guys, and I started watching shows of Je uh, Jesus and Mohammed. Was it because we're handsome or just because we're... Because nah. we're just... Oh, well, I'm a stunningly gorgeous beast. Yeah. Don't hate. The please. set was very nice. Okay. Um, uh, so <laughs> I, I wanted to hear what Christians had to say. I wanted to hear about Jesus and God. I wanted to hear about it. And it really began to attract me. So I wanted to... I got this overwhelming feeling that I wanted to read the Bible again. I hadn't read the Bible. I hadn't touched the Bible except to maybe disprove it to some Christians uh, in years. So I went, and, um, went online and started reading the Bible. And I you know, always liked uh, the Gospel of Matthew. I read the Gospel of Matthew. And it was like the encasement that surrounded my heart, what I called Iman, which I look at as something that's demonic, this oppression over Muslims. It began to melt away slowly. And I, and, you know, I really began to think about a lot of the things these Christians were saying to me, like how can a 50-year-old man consummate a marriage with a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old girl? You know, I justify this because well, Allah and his messengers say it's okay. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, I bet. <laughs> you know, and I really began to think about, you know, God of the Bible, he's holy. He has a holy standard that never changes for nobody for no time. But Allah, he keeps changing his standards all the time. You know, don't marry more than four women. But for you, Muhammad, it's okay. You know, it, it, what kind of God is this? You know, that he, you know, he abrogates his scriptures and he doesn't say why he does. He abrogates his scriptures. You know, so I was, I, at this point, I was like, I reached another, you know, a mountaintop where I was, I'm done with this. I can't, I can't do this. I can't get up and pray Fedra anymore. I can't keep going to the masjid and just going through the motions and praying and fasting and all this stuff. I don't even believe in this anymore at this point. And I, and I just became convinced at that point, Jesus Christ was real. Jesus Christ was the son of God and Jesus Christ resurrected. It was true. Mm -hmm. I knew it was true. This Holy Spirit came into my heart and convicted me that he resurrected from the grave. And, cause, and since he resurrected from the grave, I have to confess him as Lord. I, got, I was at work. I was the only person in the office at that time. I went in the back of the office. I got down on my knees and I confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior and asked him to forgive me. And I know from assurance of salvation that I have inside of me that I was regenerated from that point. I was a new creation in Christ. So Farhan, even as an agnostic theist, said he liked Jesus better than Muhammad. What would you say? Who do you yeah. like better? I like Jesus <laughs> better than Mohammed. Yes, I like Jesus better than everybody. Wow, that's all of us. That's all. Of, uh, well, okay, interesting. Well, cool. Th thank you, uh, thank you, CL. And we have uh, full phone lines right now, and not a lot of time to get to them. So we're going to try and get uh, through a bunch of callers who've been waiting patiently uh, as quickly as we can. So if you have a um, if you have a question for Farhan or a question for CL. Um, uh, please specify, if you can, who your question's for, unless it's just a, a, a general question. Uh, and please keep them, keep them uh, as short as possible because we want to try and get to everyone. Uh, but we'll go ahead and uh, open up for our first caller. Who do we have on the line? Hello. Hello. Hello, yes. How are you? Great show. God bless you. Lord Great bless testimony, you. Uh, um, my com I have a comment, actually. It's not a question. Okay. Uh, back to the Surah Al-Ahzab the one that dealt with uh, Zainab's affair with Muhammad or Muhammad's affair with Zainab. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the same uh, verse, you can see that Muhammad uh, proves he's a liar. Hmm. How? When Allah is unhappy with him and telling him why you are hiding on your heart what exactly. God has been exposed or showed. And Muhammad has been hiding in his heart and telling people that, no, he doesn't have a loss. Of, so that's a lying. That's also uh, another... Uh, another uh, big uh, bombshell on top of Muhammad, uh, you know, uh, proving that he is uh, false and, uh, and a liar and, uh, and all kind of, uh, all kind of uh, bad things that stuck, in, uh, you know, to him. Uh, thank you, guys. God bless you, uh, and, yeah, and, and good night. Lord Jesus bless you. Muhammad. Excellent point. Yeah, go ahead. You saying, I was I said, talk about Jesus and Muhammad. Here's Muhammad. He's secretly lusting for <laughs> Zainab, and Allah tells him, you know you're lusting for Zainab. You can have her. But what did Jesus say? And the and uh, uh, you know the discourse you know on the sermon on, on the Mount, sermon yes, on the Mount. exactly Matthew you know, five twenty seven twenty eight yep you know it, you talk about committing adultery and fornication and whatnot no when you look at a woman and you want to possess her mm -hmm. 
you've already committed fornication and adultery in your heart already. Amen. Exactly. Yeah, and, and not only that, even uh, in the Hadith, we find Muhammad would see a woman and he would be aroused. And, and he taught his followers to run home to their wives. Exactly. So Muhammad would run home to his wife when he was aroused by another Here's woman. A, th yeah. And Muslims look at that as a good having, thing, right? Having, well, well, he yeah, ran home to his wife though. and he had sex with his wife. Put in perspective. He, he was aroused by another woman, and then he goes sleeps with his wife as he has desires. Yeah, who's he thinking about there? Now, you tell your wife <laughs> when you're making love to her, oh, by the way, I have this woman in my mind as I'm making yeah, really, love to her. Yeah, really, or, or even, yeah. if you, even if you just said, even if you could somehow turn your attention to totally to your wife after that, if you just, I mean, you ran home and said, wow, I just saw this really hot woman. Go, yeah. go, go get your clothes off. That's your prophet, Muslims. That's Precisely. the guy you believe in. That's not us. That's not, that's not, what, that's not something we're making up. That's according to the Hadith. Uh, uh, that's your teal. <laughs> you can approach it any way you exactly. want to. Wow, yeah. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. You, uh, any way you want. That's what the Quran says. Uh, all right, thank you for your comment. Uh, who do we have on our uh, next call? Jace. Hello? Jace. Yes, hi. Yeah, we hear you. Um, yes, I'm from Texas. Hey, all right, how you doing? My friend. I'm um, good. I, I really appreciate you guys on this show. I enjoy watching it. Praise the Lord Jesus. We enjoy having you watching and listening. Hey, um, what, uh, yeah, what, what, what do you have as a question or comment? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, one of the biggest problems with Islam is that it's really empty as to the uh, topic of redemption of sins. I mean, uh, one of the 99 names of Allah in the Quran is uh, the just and uh, their just God is not doing anything uh, to uh, redeem them of their sins in a in such a manner that uh, Jesus uh, oh. did when he was sent. In, in my, his first my, my young brother, you'll be shocked to hear this. David Wood did a show on this, and Lord willing, will come up again. In the Christian understanding, God, who is perfectly just, cannot simply overlook sin. Sin must be punished. Yet God, who is perfectly loving took the punishment of sin in the person of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> in Islam, Allah does forgive Muslims, but the reason why He forgives them, forgives them is because according to the so-called authentic traditions attributed to Islam, for example, Sahih Muslim, <clears throat> and in the English translation, the number is 6665, 6666, 6668. If you get the Sahih Muslim, English translation, that's the numbering. <clears throat> Allah will take the sins committed by Muslims, unload them and Jews and Christians, and send them to hell as a ransom and sacrifice for the sins committed by Muslims. That's why He forgives them. What a beautiful uh, system of salvation. <laughs> yeah, by, by the way, uh, uh, brother, how old are you? Thirteen. Wow, wow! Look at that. You hear that? I, Praise I the Lord Jesus. Sounded kind of young, uh, thirteen, and already uh, already studying Islam. Well, yeah, uh, I actually, I actually have. I, I've been researching religion for a long time. I have a condition that makes me really interested in certain subjects. Do you do you have the links to our websites, young brother? Uh, the ABN or uh, no, no, our own websites where we have articles, we have blog posts, as well as. Uh, YouTube clips on various subjects that will help you grow in the understanding of these issues. Let me give them to you. <clears throat> David Wood runs a blog, blog uh, site called AnsweringMuslims.com. AnsweringMuslims.com. And then we both write for a website considered by many to be the top Christian website refuting Islam, defending Christianity. Answering-Islam.org answering-islam.org spend some time over sausage pizza reading over the articles or watching the YouTube clips because that's what I do okay. alright uh, anything else for us before we go to the next caller um, no thank you but I really appreciate you guys and uh, uh, Mr. Shimon I wish you the best on your voice we right. love you for the sake of Jesus, and may he watch over you and your family and, and I wish the I best for it. Sam with his face not just his voice <laughs> <laughs> Yes. All right, let's go on to our next caller. Who do we have? So funny, I forgot to laugh. Hi, who do we have on the line? My name's David. Hello? Hi. Oh, no, too many Davids, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent name. Um, go ahead. What do you have for us? Hey, first, I want to say hi, David. Hi, Sam. Hi, CL. And hi, Farhan. How, how are you, brother? And, and then I want to say hallelujah for CL. 
Uh, praise the Lord that he's a Christian. Hallelujah, brother, in Jesus' name. And earlier he was talking about, he, he went to a church, and there was this lady who was saying that she was a prophet. Actually, I have this one question, and then I just have a couple short comments. But okay. the question is about the prophet. Like, what's, what's your guys' um, like, what do you think about somebody saying that they're a prophet? If, they're, yeah. if you're a Christian, okay. can, do you think anybody has Good the right question. to say he's a prophet? Yeah, well, well, the the first thing, if someone if someone says that he's a prophet, the first thing I would want to know is what what he means. Precisely, right? that's exactly. I'll, I'll tell what me I was exactly say. what you mean when you say a prophet. And that's why I asked Ciel, is this person claiming to be bring new revelations, or is this person just being claiming to be able to predict certain events? Because yeah. as as a Christian, I would believe uh, that the second one is possible that 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 God can give someone uh, some kind of knowledge of yeah. something that's going to exactly, happen in yeah. the future. And we even find that in the Book of Acts. Yeah. Right. We even find in the book yeah. of Acts that there were certain people who could say, look, get ready. Something's about to happen. Yeah. Uh, so if that's the case, and there are some people who believe that those, you know, that, that, that those kinds of gifts were just just for that time or whatever. But I, as a Christian, I would have to acknowledge the possibility. So I wouldn't yeah. just say uh, you're evil, you're a liar, you're possessed or something like that. If someone claimed to be a prophet in that sense. But if someone comes along and says, I have new inspired revelation of God on par with the, you know, with the New Testament. Uh, we're going to have a problem right there. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me further confirm yeah. that. For, Let me confirm that from Scripture. Uh, the term prophet in of itself simply means one who proclaims. But the way we define the term prophet is someone who announces the future. That's not necessarily the definition of a prophet. If you go through Scriptures, a prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of God, proclaiming His will to His people, as well as going before God on behalf of God's people. So a prophet is one who simply proclaims the message of God. In that broader generic definition, Dave is a prophet, Ciel is a prophet, I'm a prophet, because we are proclaiming the revealed Word of God, what God has made known in Scripture. Now, if you mean prophet with a capital P, prophet like Moses, <clears throat> where God gives him revelation that's binding on all Christians everywhere, that kind of prophet no longer exists today. And what's the proof of that assertion? Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, and this is what it says. <clears throat> I hope my voice keeps up. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, talking about the church of Jesus Christ being the temple of the living God by which he lives through his spirit. <clears throat> this is what it says. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Notice, the apostles and prophets were the foundation of the building. Once the foundation is laid, you can't lay another foundation on top of it. What this basically means is that during the time of the first century, and here goes my voice, the apostles like Peter and Paul and the prophets who were functioning at the time of the, of the apostles were given supernatural revelation, which was binding on all Christians everywhere because that revelation was the foundation upon which we Christians build upon. Since that foundation has been laid, there won't be another foundation. So there are no prophets, capital P, like Moses, or the prophets at the time of the apostles, but there are prophets, lowercase p, that proclaim the word of God. And like David, I do agree that God can make known to me something about David's life that otherwise would be inaccessible for me to know. So I do agree with that. I hope that answered the question before my voice gives out. I, All right. I just hope that your voice gives out after the show is over. What about uh, tomorrow's show, though? Well, then I hope your voice comes back for about two hours <laughs> and then goes out one more time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, we, 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 uh, we hope that answered the question. Uh, who do we have yeah. on the line next? Hello, next caller. Hello. Hey. Uh, hey, brother, brother Sam. It's Eric from England. Eric, my friend, you're the one who leaves comments for me on Facebook, right? Oh, yes, 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 that's the one, yeah. I, I figured you out now. <laughs> oh, well, uh, brother Sam, uh, yes. I'd like to ask permission uh, from you, like, if, if I may, like, um, I, I, you, you know, can I compile the um, material from answering Islam to, mm -hmm. like, you know, translate it to Indonesian so more people get access to it? Well, what, what, well, what I'll do is invi invite you to be part of the team and actually translate for the website itself because we have various languages and we're looking for volunteers to translate our articles in more languages. So if you're willing to do that, 
You can translate the material in Indonesian. We'll start an Indonesian section. Yeah, sure. Uh, and Send me I'll your like email on Facebook. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, uh, will do. Uh, I'd like to ask Brother Ciel a question then. Yes, yes. All right, uh, Brother Ciel, you know, like uh, a lot of Muslims, like, uh, you know, in my country, for example, you know, they, they just uh, recite the Quran, uh, you know, do, do the Salat and, and all that without actually understanding um, the, the actual meaning of the Quran. How far do you agree that uh, to the statement that when they actually understand it, they will either become a Muslim extremist who are willing to blow themselves up, or uh, they will think like, I'm definitely better than this, and therefore I'm going to leave Islam. Um, that's going to be it. Thanks, brother. I'll take the answer off the line. Cheers, guys. By the way, Dave, when he finishes his question, make sure Farhan is still around, because we haven't gotten to him in okay. over 20 minutes. But go ahead, Seal. Well, he got off the air, so I can't really mm -hmm. yeah, now you keep can the question to him. But from what I understood, he's asking, you know, if people who don't uh, know Arabic, if they, they're reciting the Quran and they start to begin to understand what it means, are they going to become extremists or are they going to leave Islam? Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, that kind of question, um, you can't, you know, we have to be fair to Muslims. We have to be fair when we uh, come against Islam. I can't say that. Everybody who, who understands the Quran is going to strap a bomb on themselves and yeah. go kill themselves. I mean, that's, that's a, a big, broad brush to say. But, I mean, when you sit and read parts of the Quran that are calling for jihad, and you, the Quran tells you you have to have a, you know, a hatred for non-Muslims, and like one Muslim uh, cleric on a, on a show in the Middle East said, you have to have a positive hatred. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> positive hatred? Yeah, positive mm, hatred. I know you could have positive hatred. Um, knowing the Arabic could uh, is possible. Uh, uh, just knowing Arabic is not going to cause you to go extreme or even necessarily leave, leave Islam. Yeah, it because, be because there, there, are always, there are always multiple influences exactly. on people, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, for instance, Muslims in the West, uh, they're not just influenced by the Quran. They're influenced by television. They're influenced mm -hmm. by music. They're influenced exactly. by their friends. They're influenced by their schools and so on. Yeah. And it, it's almost impossible to, to totally strip away every other influence and just mm -hmm. zero in on the Quran. Well, what we could say is if you were able to do that, if a person could do that, mm -hmm. and some people can get closer to that than others, if a person was able to totally strip away every, th every other influence on them and was able to just zero in on the intended meaning of the Quran, mm. would a person like that be confronted with a problem, namely, I either have to be pretty darn violent uh, or I need to abandon this, it's not true? Yeah. Might be able to say that. I think I would. I would. Well, yeah, I mean, if you had no other influence but what the Quran literally says... And the example of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. yeah. An example of Muhammad, then you, I mean, if you're going to be a good Muslim, you have to do what it says and do what Muhammad did, which would mean you would be pretty extreme. In <laughs> fact, just to confirm something he said, I actually, and people may be shocked for me to say this, I have high respect for Sheikh Omar Bakri and Anjum Chadri mm -hmm. because they tell it like it is, they don't sugarcoat it, and they're not afraid. Yeah, and we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't like their views, but we respect them in the sense that Right. At least they're not watering it down, and at least they're, exactly. they're, 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 they're not hypocrites, in other words, right? Yeah, they're, they're saying, not, this yeah. is what Islam is, and we have no duty, uh, no, uh, no right to water it down mm -hmm. or sugarcoat it, mm -hmm. because this is the religion, this is how it was practiced by Muhammad and his companions. You want to be a true Muslim, then you've got to jump on board and do what we yeah, do. In other words, we, we open up the Quran, and we find the utmost condemnation on the same level of, of mushriks and so on, right? Yeah. Of the hypocrites, the people who are commanded to go out and fight and come up with excuses, right? Mm -hmm. And the excuses that Muslims use today would be, uh, you know, deep down they just don't want to. That's their excuse for not going out and doing what, uh, what Islam commands. And while you are, in, according to your Quran, you are in trouble, you Western Muslims with your Christian friends and your... <laughs> <laughs> like the Western lifestyle, the yeah, you know, easiness and the, uh, and the good living. Yeah, you, you want to give it up. Yeah, you love it. You love it. You love, it. You love the West. And that, according to Islam, is a one-way ticket to hell. That's right. uh, all right, we have several more callers on the line. I uh, want to try to get through them very quickly because I want to give a couple minutes uh, at the end of the program to CL and to Farhan uh, to you know, say any final words they want to say to all the Muslims out there who are watching. So who do we have for our next caller? 
Hello. Um, yeah. Ms. Shilpa from London. Brother, praise the Lord. Hello. Hi, sister. Hi, uh, brother. Hello. Um, how are you? It's a great show. Um, it's great uh, to see uh, people who left Islam. Mm -hmm. So I just have a couple of questions for Brother CL and a short message for Brother uh, for Faran. Actually, um, so yes. when Christians try to look for a church, they 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 look for a church where Bible is preached accurately, correctly. So um, I wonder what criteria Muslims use if they if they actually have to choose a mosque they have to go to uh, because the, their prominent leaders like Zakir Naik and people they obviously are not saying exactly how it is in Quran. They are sort of you know changing it and twisting it. So do they, are they really bothered that the Qur'an is preached exactly as it is? Um, and uh, when, when, uh, the, uh, when Brother Seal was a Muslim, uh, uh, did, what sort of fight did he have with his conscience, uh, according to Romans 2.15? Um, because if you take Islam seriously and you know, hate uh, non-Muslims and take up jihad or anything like that, uh, what struggle do they have to go through before you know um, they actually take that step? Um, they just have to defeat themselves, uh, and the flesh has to win. So, and just to uh, Faran, um, I left Hinduism. I was a Hindu. I was born and brought up as a Hindu for 22 years. So, um, those gods don't speak to you. Only Jesus speaks. Um, that was the only reason I left. So, if uh, Faran wants to take that message. Okay, thank you, brothers. I'll just uh, listen on offline. Thank you. Lord bless you. Lord. All right, Seal. Okay, um, yeah, as a Christian now, as, as I'm a Christian, a Christian, when I went out to go look for a church, it was very important that it was Bible-based, that the Word of God was being used. Somebody just wasn't standing up there spewing out their own ideas and jokes or whatever. I want to hear about the Bible. It was very important that they explain the Bible correctly. And that's important to a lot of Muslims. When I was a Muslim, that's one of the things that led me away from the Tabalikis and the different sets that I was around, the Tabalikis and the Akwanis and all those people. And I saw that the Salafis were quoting directly from the Quran and the Hadith and from the you know, sources from the first three generations who Muhammad himself say, said were upon the correct path. I like those guys because they're quoting the, sor the source, they're explaining the source. So, yeah, the same thing applies to a lot of Muslims as well. Um, now, it was a second part to that question that she asked. Uh, Would you recall what it was? Um, yeah, uh, what, what kind of struggles did you have with yeah, your with conscience? Your conscience yeah, with your conscience. Um, she mentioned Romans 2.15 because it says your conscience will uh -huh. convict you or acquit you because the law is written in your heart. Okay. So she's saying since that is true, then something must have been going on internally with you. Cause you to, so what kind of these internal struggles you had? That's what you want to know. Uh, the major internal struggle that I had was all the work that I was putting in for Islam and all the things I was doing to be a good Muslim. I had no assurance that I was going to die and enter into Jannah at all. Um, I really didn't know what was going to happen to me when I, when I died. Wow. That's so, I mean, you can, you can think about that. That would weigh heavily on your heart. You're doing all this stuff for God. You're doing all these rituals. You're doing all this work. You have no idea what's going to happen when you die. That, that and and, and but is that just, uh, Sam, just, and we have to be quick here because we have a, we have yeah, a lot yeah, more yeah, callers. Yeah. Uh, so very brief yeah. answer. Is that just CL who doesn't know what's no. going to happen to him after death? Chapter or? 46, verse 9 of the Quran, and it's confirmed by the authentic hadith like Sal Bukhari. Muhammad says that he's uh, no new thing among the messengers and that he does not know what Allah will do with him or, or with the people. Mm -hmm. 46 verse 9. So, so Muhammad quick, didn't know what Allah was going to do with him. And you know what's the proof of that? You want, you want today proof that Muhammad's destiny is uncertain? Every time a Muslim mentions his name, he says, may the prayers and peace of Allah be upon him. Now Dave, for the life of me. If Muhammad is in a state of peace, why are you praying for Allah to grant him peace? Yeah, if Muhammad's up there and he's got like a trillion virgins, because keep in mind when you hear 70 or 72, that's the minimum if you make it. Yeah. That's the minimum. The, more, the better you are, the more you get. If Muhammad is really as great as Muslims think, he should be up there in one massive eternal orgy, spending all of ex his existence deflowering virgins. Why are, you playing for, why are you praying for peace on him? Yeah, he already is in it, right? Are you sure it's not raisins though? I thought it was no, raisins. Raisins. <laughs> <laughs>
I like that video. So, <laughs> so yes, this is this is not just a, this wasn't just a problem for CL. This is a problem for Muslims in general. It's so bad. Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr said, "This is Abu Bakr. Are you yeah. are you Muslims out there as great as Abu Bakr? Tell me right now. Think I yes or no." Abu Bakr said, "If he had one foot in paradise, he would still fear Allah's deception because according to Islam, God could even, God could trick you. You're about to step into heaven, and it's just a trick. Actually, I decided you I decided to send you to hell." Ha! Real quickly, Dave. Yeah. You know that's a sign of a true believer. You know why? When Abu Bakr said that, he was actually showing that he was a true believer. Because according to chapter 7, verse 99 of the Quran, it says this about the makr of Allah. The word makr means deception or conniving. It goes, are they then, speaking of disbelievers, secure from Allah's uh, deception or conniving? No one deems himself secure from Allah's conniving except those that perish. Mm -hmm. Meaning only those who are disbelievers think that they are safe from the makr of Allah. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if you're a believer, you know that you're never safe from his makr or scheming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so hang on, all these Muslims out there who are confident, who are confident. They are not, then they are disbelievers. They're, wow. Chapter 7, verse 99 of the Quran. Ladies and gentlemen out there, you Muslims, welcome to the Sam Shamoon School of Quranic Instruction. You're learning <laughs> about your religion, things that you should be learning in the mosque, and your <laughs> leaders just never tell you because they know you'd leave Islam if you found these things in out. In Jesus' name, may you leave Islam and Amen. find Jesus. All right, next caller, who do we have? No, by the way, she had a question for Farhan, didn't she? Yeah. She, she wanted Farhan to make a, or no, no, it wasn't. Oh, she, was had a comment. she had a comment, she had a comment. Poor well, Farhan. Well, Hang in there, Farhan. We'll get a question for you, we promise. <laughs> no, we're going to turn things over to Farhan in the end uh, to, to make yeah. any comments you might want to make. Who do we have next? Hello? Hi, my name is Sheikh Ture. I'm from West Africa, Mali, but I'm calling from Albania, New York. Oh. Um, I just want to make... I just want to make a clarification before I ask uh, the brother in the mirror a question. Last night, a Muslim guy called you guys and said, uh, I think his name is, I don't remember his name, but he said that Allah praised to himself when he was explaining the ayah. Oh, yeah, he's talking about the, Manu. The he said that yesterday. Okay, Manu, exactly, Manu. I want to clarify that what okay. he said is totally wrong, and he is ignorant about Islam, and he needs to learn. Islam shouldn't be calling you guys and make his own interpretation. And Allah is praying. Allah does not pray to himself. Allah is praying on Muhammad. It is mentioning of Muhammad in the company of the angels. Yeah, yeah. And the prayers of the angel and Muhammad is them asking Allah, the Almighty God, to forgive Muhammad. And yes, our, our prayer on Muhammad is asking Allah to increase the mentioning of Muhammad in the company of the angels. So, yeah. so, are you, so, so do you get to intercede for Muhammad here on earth, Muslims? We don't get to intercede for him at all. And he would be, he's, he's the one who going to intercede for us. We don't intercede for him. We ask him, Allah, to increase his mention. We are praying, we are praying to Allah to increase his mentioning in the company of the angel. We can intercede for him. Yeah. We can, we don't, we can, can do I, that. We don't have anything. Can I, can you know? I address your... Uh, can I address okay, your question? Okay. I don't want him to hang up. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, we're I wish you had called earlier. Yeah. But please, brother, my brother in humanity, please call tomorrow night, Lord willing. Call earlier. We'll open up the phone lines earlier. We're going to be on 10 o'clock again because our time is on. Let me answer real quickly <clears throat> your argument. But let me explain for the audience who probably didn't understand what he meant. He goes, Allah's prayers means that he mentions Muhammad and praises him in the heavenly host. Now, is that what the Quran says? No, but... Let's, let's say his interpretation may have some plausibility. The reason why it can't be the meaning of the passage is because my brother in humanity, like some other Muslims, keep ignoring the fact. It says both Allah and the angels are doing this act. Mm -hmm. Notice the verb passage again. Verily, Allah and his angels pray. What he wants to do is he wants to take the same word, the same verb, that's applied to both Allah and the angels doing it, and then define the verb differently depending on whether it's Allah or the angels. In other words, although both of them are engaged in the same act, it doesn't have the same meaning. Mm -hmm. On what contextual basis does he then change the meaning of the verb when it says both of them are doing the same exact act? Mm -hmm. So if it, means, <clears throat> if it means that when angels pray for Muhammad, that they're, they're going before Allah, and whatever he said that they do for Muhammad, then that means the same meaning that you gave for the angels praying must have the same meaning for Allah because it says they're both doing this very same thing. 
You with me there? Yeah. And, so how do you change the definition? And, and, and just for, for the sake of our viewers who, <clears throat> who, who, who are unfamiliar with the background, because we, we've discussed this several times on the, on the program, uh, what does the basic word mean that they're using there? In the no text? Muslim would deny. If you just mention, what does salah mean? Mm -hmm. The Torah means prayer, worship. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what the word is in the Arabic. Mm -hmm. It says that Allah and His angels, yusalun. Mm -hmm. It comes from salah. Mm -hmm. And then it says, you who believe, pray for him, sallu. So just ask a Muslim before you quote the verse. Say, Muslim, what does salah mean? Oh, it means worship. Mm -hmm. It's prayer, it's worship. What does salawat mean? Oh, prayer, worship. Then you say, it says that your God does salah and salawat. Oh, well, the meaning is totally different than the meaning of the word change. Yeah. In other, in, in other words, my friend, here's the point. If the word meant, right, if the word used here meant mentions Muhammad among the heavenly host or something like that, why wouldn't the verse say Allah mentions Muhammad among the heavenly yeah. host to avoid any confusion? Yes, because what you find in the Quran is, is you Muslims, you go out and do your prayers, right? Yeah. And you know what it does when, when it tells you to pray, it's not saying mention this among the heavenly host. You have your prayers, and then the problem is it turns right around and says, oh, Allah does this too, and, and with so the angels. angels. Yeah. It uses the Arabic conjunction wa, mm -hmm. which Muslims admit is the conjunction of partnership, mm -hmm. meaning Allah and the angels together are doing this. Mm -hmm. So if we want to, suppose we grant, suppose we grant to our friend that the word means one thing when it says Allah does it, and it means something different when the angels do it, and it means something different different when when yeah, yeah. human beings do it it has all these different meanings when there are other words that could have clarified the situation and so what you have in the Quran is total confusion Precisely. The, we're using the same word and constantly changing the meaning so that people like us can come along and point out and say what could this possibly mean but it's a and clear Muslims can Arabic Quran. Yeah, it's supposed yeah. to clear it's, that's, exactly. that's what I was getting to your Quran your book claims over and over and over again like a beating drum to be clear Clear, and your Allah can't even use one basic word as a, a word as important as prayer consistently and as you know, to constantly uh, change the meaning. Real quickly, add to your point. They say the Arabic is a very rich uh, uh, and expressive language. Mm -hmm. Weren't there other words that yeah, Allah can come used? up with it's another word? It's like Number Allah, two. I don't know what oh, I don't know what word I'm going to use here. Oh, let me use the same word I use for people bowing down in prayer exactly. and then applying it to Allah. Secondly, even the definition he proffered, because this comes from Ibn Kathir and others, mm -hmm. it says that Allah is praising Muhammad to the heavenly host. You understand that praise it's, itself is an act of worship? You're telling me that Allah has nothing better to do but to praise a creature to all the angels in heaven. And you think that actually lessens the impact? What does the word Muhammad mean? Yeah, it means praise one. Exactly. <laughs> Most, not just yes. praise one. Superlative. Abundant yes. praise. Yes, go ahead. And what do Muslims say when they make salawat? Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Are you an Nabi? Yeah, yes, uh, yes, exactly. And even when they say Alhamdulillah, it comes from the same root meaning. All praise be to Allah. No, you just said Allah praises Muhammad. So all praise isn't to Allah. It's also given to Muhammad in heaven. And you're addressing Muhammad directly yes. in the Salat. Assalamu alaikum, ayyuhan nabi. We need to do it. This is some weird stuff, man. This is some weird stuff. <laughs> hey, wow. Yeah. Oh, when you combine that with all the reasons we had for leaving Islam, interesting stuff. All right, we're, we're almost out of time. I'm going to try to take one more caller and... Okay, I'm going to try to take one more caller, and uh, then I'm going to hand things over uh, to CL and Farhan for any final comments. Who do we have on the line? Hello, this is Jeffrey. Who? Uh, who's this? Jeffrey. Hi. Hey, Jeffrey. Hi, how's it going? Jeffrey. Yeah. Hey, what, uh, what, what's your question or comment? Uh, first of all, greetings, gentlemen. Greetings, greetings. Jeffrey. Um, I really admire... Uh, this program, it is about time. Yeah, this should have been uh, implemented many, many years ago. And all the nations of the world need uh, to be awakened. And they live in darkness by darkness of Islam. And it's about time that you guys uh, started this program. And Jesus or Muhammad, definitely Jesus. And just by the small and short comparison, Jesus never committed a crime or killed anybody. Glory to Jesus. But look at the history of Muhammad from birth to death. When he comes to power, he's nearly 66 
of wars that he implemented on Arab nations. He, he committed murders about over 10,000. He killed about over 10,000. Just I mentioned one of them. When he attacked to Abu Ghraib's uh, tribe, he beheaded 700 men and possessed their women and take Rayhan, one of the, the most beautiful girls at that tribe, as a wife. And Rayhan had a husband, father, brothers, uncle, grandfather. They were all executed by Muhammad. And then same, the very same night, he takes Rehan as his wife. Now, is this real prophet or false prophet? And definitely is a false prophet. And also, why God sends somebody as a prophet to murder non-believers? And he did that over and over and terrified the whole territory to the point that when Muhammad died, everybody was celebrating and exiting Islam. And... If you look at the country of Iran, the government of Iran, 30, 30 years ago, all the master, so-called Ayatollah clergymen, they wanted to implement the real Islam. And look what happened. Right now, as we speak, thousands and thousands of the... Hey, uh, hey, brother, hey, brother, we're sorry, uh, uh, the sound, uh, the sound, we're having some problems uh, with the sound. We, 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 did get, we did get most of your points, though. Uh, and we thank you for them. Uh, we, we, we only have about three minutes left. Um, I wanted to give, uh, Farhan, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Hey, guy, sorry, hey, sorry we didn't get to you since we started uh, taking callers, but it's a live talking, a live yeah. call-in show, so we wanted to get to as many yeah. callers uh, as we can. Why don't you take a minute or two and uh, give any final thoughts for the Muslims out there. We know Muslims are watching this show. One of them just called in. Muslims call in regularly, cool. and we know, you know, most of them uh, don't, you know, don't actually call in. They sit and watch. So uh, what thoughts would you have for any Muslims who are watching? Well, I was wondering if I can just get, give a, a couple of wrap-up thoughts and, and, and within okay, like ahead, two or three ahead. minutes. Uh, uh, first, uh, responding, if I may. Can, can I, Dave? Sure, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, okay, quick, sure. keep it quick. Uh, for, first, responding to uh, the, the sister that called and, and made the comment to me, I wanted to thank her. And I would love to, to hear more from her and have her witness uh, to me. Uh, I obviously opened my heart and my mind and my ears uh, to her. And I would love to discuss Sanatana Dharma with her, if she may, if she spent 22 years in it. I think that would be an interesting conversation. Uh, da David, to you, we were talking about... Um, belief dynamics earlier. My, one of my current projects is beliefrevision.com. Uh, I bought that domain, domain name out to look at belief dyna dam, dynamics, belief update, belief conservation, those philosophical constructs. And I would love to discuss that with you uh, at some point, um, both looking at the philosophical and psychological implications of belief dynamics. Uh, and then Sam, uh, I, I heard you say, talk, talk about the whole Nation of Islam thing. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but it, it was during uh, your our debate that we had a yeah. couple of years ago on yeah. the Trinity in the Old Testament, where you uh, where you brought up that that, that 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 you had some type of an affiliation with the Nation yeah, of yeah. Islam, yeah, because you and mentioned they've I used to be a Muslim. Yeah, that on you YouTube, yeah. uh, of you of you making that statement. So yeah. so I was I was reminded of that because it was our debate. Um, and then final comments for any Muslims. I mean, again, you know, th think about why you're a Muslim. You know what I mean? Not not just the intellectual reasons, but think about whether you have an emotional attachment to this religion, and and and, and deal with that that emotional attachment first before you can intellectually try to grasp any of which uh, of what we're talking about. You have to get rid of those emotional obstacles first in order to 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 grasp some of the things that we're talking about here on this TV show. And besides that, thank you uh, for having me on the, sheet, uh, on, the, on the show, and I appreciate it. It's always good for uh, hearing from you guys, and keep me in your prayers. Thank you, and peace be with you. All right. Thank you, Farhan and CL. Uh, ten second. What, do you, what would you say? Uh, real quickly, I would like to say that we've been discussing a lot of things, and we've been discussing the Bible and the Quran and all these things, but I want to center it around, I want you to remember, Muslims, that there is a spiritual world. You believe in that. You believe in the jinn. You believe in shaitan. You believe in all this. I, as a Christian now, now that the Holy Spirit, I know you don't believe in this, but just listen for a second. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. 
So I can't have a jinn come and attack me or yes. possess me or lead me astray. My Lord would never allow me Amen. to go, to, go astray Lord. like that. Hallelujah. But what about your prophet, Muhammad? Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, is possessed and led astray by demons and jinn. If your prophet can be influenced by demons, how do you know you're not being influenced by a demon right now? How do you know your attachment to Islam is more than just emotional? It's spiritual, and there are spiritual beings that are misleading you. And I would just like you to think about everything we've been talking about and to pray to make sure that you're being led right. When I, the last Ramadan I had, I said a prayer. I said I prayed to the God of the universe. I didn't even say Allah. I said the Lord of the universe. I don't want to go astray. I don't want to go in the wrong direction. If for some reason I'm, I'm way off on this and I'm going in the wrong direction, please turn me around and make me go into the correct direction. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. could you pray that too? Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who aren't familiar with some of the stories uh, 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 CL just alluded to in the life of Muhammad, I suggest you re start reading your sources. Really, really very important for Muslims out there. Uh, almost everything we say on this program about Islam is totally unfamiliar to Muslims because you don't read your sources. But guess what? That's why we're here and we're happy to help. Uh, we hope you'll be with us tomorrow as we continue our marathon. We have a lot more to discuss over the next few days here on Jesus or Muhammad. See you tomorrow.